Make sure you have some skin and carrot and some crispy potato. And then I'll rub it around in the reduction a little bit. May I eat it? Yes, you may eat it. I get it now. Well? It's everything I like, made exquisitely, but what's perfect is you made it for me. Is that your speechless? Perfect bite? Perfect. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week we're taking a look at the perfect bite engineered for Penn Badgley's character on you. Kind of a morbid choice for a Valentine's Day special, I know, but what can I say? I wanted to try that roast chicken. So the first place we're starting is with the chicken itself. We want to find a high quality, preferably heritage chicken, one with nice bright yellow skin and lots of delicious fat deposits like this one. This chicken lived a much happier life than your average supermarket chicken, and you're going to taste the difference. Also, it was air chilled, which is going to give us a crispier skin, despite not having the time to dry brine overnight. Penn Badgley's character's latest creepy love interest gracefully butterflies her bird, so we're going to do the same, snipping out the spine and placing a strategic cut at the base of the breastbone so we can crack it open. This allows us to lay our chicken out flat for faster roasting times, crispier skin, and more evenly cooked meat. But for even crispier skin, we want to engage in the slightly unsettling process of separating the skin from the meat itself. Just go ahead and wriggle your fingers on it there and make sure you do this well before your date arrives. The other reason we want to separate the skin from the meat is because we're going to stuff it with compound butter. In the show, it looks like the chicken has been rubbed both under and over the skin with an herb butter. So as per Babishian tradition, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I've got some chopped fresh parsley, rosemary, and thyme, which I'm going to add to about six ounces of butter along with a generous pinch of kosher salt and a few twists of freshly ground black pepper. Mash it together with a fork until homogenous, and then we're going to start rubbing it underneath the skin of our chicken. This is way more important than the butter rubbed all over the skin itself because it's going to deeply flavor the meat. So make sure you've got the butter dispersed evenly throughout the bird. And then in the show, there's clearly butter rubbed all over the outside of the skin as well. This is not my preferred method. I feel like this is how you end up with a chicken covered in burnt herbs, but we gotta be accurate. Last stage of chicken preparation involves a sharp poking device. Grab your favorite sharp pokey thing and start poking the chicken all over, especially in the fat deposits. This is gonna help the fat better render out as it roasts and in turn give us crispy your skin. Next up, the chicken was roasted on a bed of halved heads of garlic and slices of lemon. Then I'm going to rub it down with a little bit more butter and place it in a 450 degree Fahrenheit oven for about 45 minutes. Just enough time to contend with our sides. I've got some lovely little yellow fingerlings here that I'm going to start in cold water, bring to a boil, and cook for about 15 minutes until a paring knife enters them with ease. Then I'm going to remove them to a rimmed baking sheet, let them cool off for about 10 minutes, and squash them using another rimmed baking sheet. The squashing aspect of these potatoes is going to give them more surface area and craggles and cracks, which should help us get them nice and crispy. Now, for the cooking oil, I'm going to place about a cup of canola or vegetable oil in a small saute pan, add some crushed cloves of garlic and fresh herbs, and cook over medium-low heat until bubbling and the garlic is lightly browned. Then I'm going to strain this oil into my intended potato cooking pan, bring it up to about 375 degrees Fahrenheit, and drop in the potatoes, flipping after about two to three minutes or until lightly golden brown. Let them drain on a wire rack and keep them in a low oven to keep them warm while we finish cooking the rest. Now I've got the fried garlic here from earlier, which I'm going to use to make a lovely flavor paste, combining with some freshly grated lemon zest and chopping until fine. Then all that's left to do is season our potatoes. I'm going to place them in a large bowl along with our flavor paste, a little bit of kosher salt, and some freshly ground black pepper. Then we're going to give our potatoes a spirited tossy toss, and there you have it, some super flavorful, super crispy potatoes. As for the carrots, they looked pretty simply prepared, so I'm just going to peel them, chop them in half if they're a little too thick, place them on a rim baking sheet with a little bit of olive oil, some kosher salt and freshly ground black pepper, toss to combine and place in a 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for about 30 minutes until they're nicely browned and tender. Meanwhile, our chicken is emerging from the oven looking pretty fine. The skin is evenly brown and crisp and the thickest part of the breast registers 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Whoa, sorry, I am slick with chicken fat, but whatever you do, do not cut into this chicken for at least 30 minutes. Let it rest at room temperature uncovered. Just enough time to make what looked like a balsamic reduction. Probably the simplest thing we're making today into a wide saute pan goes about a cup of high quality balsamic vinegar, which we're going to simmer over medium high heat until reduced by about half and thick and syrupy and can easily coat the back of a spoon. And with that, all of our pieces are in place and it's time to plate up. 
first we have to carve up our chicken. We're gonna start by cutting it in half at the breastbone. And I could just eat the whole half chicken like this, but no one wants to see that. So we're gonna plate it up all elegant like on the show. First, I'm going to isolate a skin on boneless breast, cut it into thick slices and plate it up alongside some crispy potatoes and roasted carrots. And there you have it, the supposed perfect bite for Joe or Will or whatever he's calling himself this season. Oh, almost forgot the balsamic reduction, AKA what I think is going to single-handedly kill this dish. And fittingly, we're gonna test this perfect bite out on Jess. Because I love you. You love me or you love the Netflix series? So this is pretty good, but the only thing I'm not really digging is this balsamic reduction. It's just overpowering the crispy potatoes and the carrots. I totally agree. I thought the balsamic reduction was a bad idea. I'm glad I'm not the only one. So it's safe to say that this is not your perfect bite. It's good, but it's not my perfect bite. So what would be in your perfect bite? I love duck. I love carbonara. Is there such a thing as duck carbonara? You're my little duck carbonara. That didn't work. Let's find out how to make duck carbonara after this commercial break. All right, and we are back, and my metric for figuring out what Jess's perfect bite is a little bit more simple. She loves duck, she loves carbonara, so I'm gonna make an all-duck carbonara. First, I'm gonna take a page out of Brad Leone's book and cure some duck egg yolks, creating a mixture of equal parts kosher salt and sugar, pouring it into a pie plate, making little divots where I'm gonna place my egg yolks, separating the egg yolks from their whites, placing them into their respective divots, and then topping them with more of the sugar-salt mixture to encase them in a sort of moisture suck cocoon. Ugh. Once we make sure they are gently but thoroughly packed in sugar and salt, it's time to cover the whole thing with plastic wrap and refrigerate for at least three and up to six days. So if you want to make this in time for Valentine's Day this Friday, get started now. After their salt cure, you will find that they have firmed up considerably, but I want them firm enough to grate like cheese. So we're going to place them in either a low oven or a dehydrator at 150 degrees Fahrenheit for about two hours until firm and dry throughout. And then on the first day that we started curing the eggs, we're also going to cure some duck breasts. We're going to start by combining four Four teaspoons each kosher salt and freshly ground pepper, five teaspoons of granulated sugar, a tablespoon of maple syrup or blackstrap molasses, and about three quarters of a teaspoon of pink curing salt or prog powder number one. To this we're going to add about two cups of distilled room temperature water, tiny whisking until most of the particulate is all but dissolved, and there you have it, a cure for our duck breasts, which we have every intention of making into duck bacon. Yes, there is such a thing, and yes, it should be in your mouth right now. We're going to pour the cure over the breasts until they are submerged, wrap the whole thing in plastic, wrap and refrigerate for at least a day and up to three, flipping every 12 hours or so to make sure that everybody's getting a little bit of attention. A few days later and you should find that your duck breasts have firmed up significantly the same way that pork belly would if you were curing that for bacon. We're going to thoroughly rinse and pat the breasts dry and then it's time to smoke these suckers. You can do this via your smoking method of choice. I'm using this stovetop smoker with some cherry and apple wood chips and ideally you want to smoke at about 225 degrees for about two hours. This is unfortunately a rather imprecise process process using a stovetop smoker, but duck breasts are pretty forgiving because they're so darn fatty. So I'm going to get this thing smoking, wrap it tightly in aluminium foil, and try to smoke it as slow and low as possible until the thickest part of the breast registers 150 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, we should find that our duck breasts have turned into a pair of smoky dazzlers, which we are going to cover and chill in the fridge completely before utilization. Next and last, we have the duck egg pasta itself. I'm going with an equal mix that's 150 grams each of all-purpose and durum semolina flours, about 3 grams of kosher salt, tiny whisk together, make a well in the center, crack in two duck eggs, should be about 120 grams, but we want a total liquid weight of 135 grams, so we're going to make up the rest with olive oil. Beat into a slurry using a fork, taking in little bits of flour with each turn, until it's nice and thick and ready to be mixed via paddle. Go ahead and mix this together for one to two minutes until all the liquid has been absorbed by the flours, but it's still pretty dry and crumbly. Semolina flour is very patient when it comes to sucking up liquid, so we're going to wrap it in plastic wrap and let it rest for 20 minutes before kneading by hand into a smooth, taut ball. Now this very dry pasta dough is ideally suited for a pasta extruder like this one. I find that extruded pasta has that restaurant style chew to it that is very very difficult to achieve by hand. So once you have extruded all of your pasta into your preferred shape, we are covering these little pasta nests with plastic wrap and refrigerating until we're ready to use them. Or you could freeze them and have fresh pasta whenever you like. But for me, pasta time is now, so it's time to start cutting up our duck bacon into la don, or whatever the Italian equivalent is to la don. Go ahead and cut your duck bacon up into 
thick, hot, nasty-ass chunks, which we are going to start in a cold pan and slowly crisp over medium heat in order to render out as much fat as possible. Meanwhile, right before we cook our pasta, we're making our sort of carbonara custard out of two duck eggs plus one extra duck egg yolk for a little bit of added richness. We're going to beat this until homogenous and then add about a half a cup of freshly grated Pecorino Romano cheese, along with the requisite twists of freshly ground black pepper. Beat to combine, and then we're heading back over to the stovetop where our bacon is crisp, so we're going to add two cloves of crushed garlic, cooking for about one minute over medium-low heat until fragrant. While that's going, we're going to add our pasta to some boiling water we've kept at the ready. Cook not a second longer than 90 seconds. Kill the heat under our frying pan. Add the pasta directly to the frying pan and toss in the duck bacon and duck bacon fat. Then we're immediately bringing this mixture over to a pre-warmed metal bowl. Into the bowl goes our pasta, and on top of that goes our egg and cheese mixture. Also a generous but cautious pinch of kosher salt, and about a quarter cup of pasta cooking water, more as necessary. Toss this guy rigorously, which is going to give us a nice creamy sauce as the residual heat from the pasta gently cooks the eggs into the perfect custard. Twist into pretty little nests by virtue of a carving fork and soup ladle, and then for some extra decorative eggy richness, we're going to generously grate our cured duck egg yolks over top. Then since this dish doesn't really go with red wine, we're going to go with champagne instead. And there you have it, the ultimate expression of duck and carbonara. Now all there is left to do is see if it's her perfect bite. This is really difficult. I can't get it on the boring. It's okay, you're not Italian. Let me help. It takes years and years of practice. So, what do you think? Holy sh**. It's duck. It's carbonara. It's everything I wanted. This is my perfect bite. Now, are you just saying that because that's what we wrote in the script? Uh, hold on, I lost my spot. Mm, no, no. Okay, but seriously, do you like it? But seriously, I love it. Plus, dude, you made duck bacon. Definitely a member of the Clean Jazz Club. What? <laughs>